My name is Yuri Chernov. I'm a professor of biology here at Georgia Tech. My laboratory is studying uh, the yeast module for amyloids and prions. So I need to tell you a little bit about prions and amyloids. So one well-known example of a prion is a mad cow disease. Mad cow disease is a neurodegenerative disease which can be transmitted from cows to humans consuming infected meat. And in fact, this disease is not very funny. It's not like shown on this slide. It's actually causing death, and this is incurable. So the unusual feature of this infectious disease is that this is transmitted not by bacteria, not by a virus, but by a protein. The protein, called a prion protein, in an unusual shape, becomes an infectious agent. It forms the oligomeric structures, and it can immobilize the non-prion protein of exact same sequence produced by a host organism into those structures and convert it into a prion shape. So as a result, you have a transmission of protein conformation by infection. So those Oligomeric structures formed by prion protein are assembled into the fiber-like, highly ordered structures called amyloids. And in this way, the amyloids formed by prions resemble the amyloids formed in case of some other so-called neural inclusion diseases. So why is it interesting to study prions? First of all, those are infectious diseases which are dangerous on their own. However, maybe even more important is that prions provide a model for studying other amyloid diseases, and some of those other amyloid diseases are very widespread. Alzheimer disease is one example. If you live over 85, you have one chance out of two to develop Alzheimer disease. And this disease actually causes death as well. And so far, there is no cure. So uh, basically, uh, if we eradicate cancer, if we eradicate other diseases, which are major cause of death now, specifically heart diseases, so in next generation, Alzheimer's disease will become a major cause of death. So we better be prepared. However, in addition to causing important diseases, amyloids and prions also represent the nanostructures, the self-assembled nanostructures, which can be used for technological purposes. And in fact, one example of such a nanostructure formed by an amyloid, we already know for quite a long time. This is silk, which has been used by insects, spiders, and humans for many years. Finally, from a, from a geneticist's point of view, and my origin is from genetics, uh, prions provide a new mechanism for transmission of information which is not coded in DNA sequence, but is coded in the protein structure. In this way, they can contribute to genetic and epigenetic phenomena, to, genetic, to genetics phenomena and to epigenetic inheritance. If you compare the sequential coding provided by nucleic acids to the structural coding provided by prions, you can see that in case of sequential coding, the sequence of nucleotides of the DNA strand has been reproduced by replication. However, in case of the structural templating used by prions, the structure of the protein molecule has been reproduced by converting the protein molecule of a different structure into a new shape. So structural and sequential templating is based on different principles, but may lead to the same consequences. So we already know very well that sequential templating is very efficiently used in nature. Is structural templating used for anything useful? Well, it was a widespread belief among the ancient tribes that if you eat your enemy, who is brave and strong and happy, you will become braver 
and stronger or at least happier. So this is in full accordance with the prion module. So if the enemy has useful prions, those would be transmitted, prions of happiness. Now, those experiments would be very difficult to perform in humans and even in cows. Those would become very expensive. However, we do have a small cow which can be used for these experiments, which is called yeast. Yeast is a unicellular eukaryotic organism. It is a microorganism, essentially. We can use all the microbial techniques. However, it has a typical eukaryotic organization of the cell, which is not much different from humans and cows. And yeast is, of course, well known for its ability to produce wine, beer, and bread. However, yeast can also produce prions. Yeast prions, which can actually cause kind of a prion disease in yeast. And you can actually see those prions, like here on the slide, for example, you see those clumps of the fluorescent protein, having a fluorescent tag. Those are clumps formed by prion amyloids in the yeast cell. Sometimes they may actually have the filamentous shape, and in this case you can see the filaments of the aggregating uh, prionogenic proteins in the yeast cell. So we can actually distinguish the yeast cells containing prions, and we can study uh, prion and amyloids in yeast. We can actually put the human proteins causing amyloid diseases into the yeast cell, and we can also study those human proteins in the yeast environment. So if you're interested in uh, what specifically we are doing, there is a lot to tell you about. So I would invite you to visit our lab, and we will be happy to tell you about all the details of our experiments with yeast, which actually uh, enable us to learn about the mechanisms by which cells control formation and propagation and elimination of prions and amyloids, and about the evolution and variability of those prionogenic and amyloidogenic sequences. Thank you.